नंबर वन बनाना है ना बीजेपी का संकल्प है कर्नाटका को नंबर वन बनाना इट्स सर्टनली गोइंग टू बी अ पॉलिटिकली हॉट समर विद द इलेक्शन कमीशन ऑफ इंडिया डिसाइडिंग दैट इलेक्शंस विल बी हेल्ड इन कर्नाटका ऑन मे टेन हम झूठे वायदे नहीं करते हैं पंद्रह लाख रुपए बैंक अकाउंट में डालने वाले वायदे हम नहीं करेंगे और याद रखिए जितना पैसा बीजेपी ने आपसे लिया उतना पैसा हम आपकी जेब में वापस डालेंगे The political battleground of Karnataka now the high stakes high voltage campaign has entered its last leg people are very clear that the elections are on local issues the government of Karnataka is the most corrupt government in the country Hi everybody the Karnataka election campaign are in full swing and with each passing day the political warfare is heating up to the next level while on one side the political parties are throwing extreme allegations at each other on the other side the media is putting out whatever they can find not to educate people but to make money with trps if that is the question rasak my 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 follow up to that is simple language war and a language debate has now sparked yet again puchna chahta hu unna ka bhi hai bharatiya janta party ka mere beech mein bolna hai kyunki inke paas jawab nahi hai where was the congress party then 1200 rupees ka mere paenge and instead of educating the citizens on how to assess a state's performance the entire focus of the media has been on propagandist debates which make no sense at all which is why we decided to pull up our socks and do what indian media must be doing which is to educate you and give you a framework on how to assess the state government of karnataka so in this episode today let's cut the bullshit and try to understand what is the financial status of the karnataka state how are they managing their tax base money how is the government making the state more and more conducive for new industries to be built and what do the social indicators of karnataka say about the condition of poor this video is brought to you by chat gbd plus communication master class course people in the coming weekend i'll be conducting a special live chat gbd workshop for all the communication master class students to help you understand how you can use the secret prompts of chat gbd for storytelling for business research and even english speaking so if you are somebody who struggles to speak your ideas out in public if you are someone who lacks the confidence to speak in public or if you are someone who often mumbles while presenting your thoughts i would highly recommend you to join the communication masterclass course this course is a 6 weeks course whereby i will take you step by step from a beginners level all the way up to a tedx level presentation skill the best part is that if you have any doubts regarding the course i will personally talk to you during our weekly live sessions to help you overcome every fear you have and if you enroll for this course before the next weekend you can attend this workshop live with all other students in the community so if you want to master your art of communication and if you want to present your ideas in the most powerful manner possible come join our communication masterclass course using the link in the description and i will see you in the class people the most important indicators to analyze any government can be divided into two categories financial and social as in how has the state managed its money for economic growth and at the same time what has the state done to uplift the people from the bottom of the pyramid so if a state has billion dollar businesses like reliance and tata being set up but its poverty and starvation rates are increasing then it is a terrible performance overall similarly if a state has a gdp of 50 billion dollars with no poverty and no starvation but has a debt of 200 billion dollars it clearly states that the state government is artificially using the public funds to eradicate poverty so every state needs to have a fine balance between economic growth and social security for its people if this is very very clear to you let's first dive into the financial metrics of the state of karnataka now we will just like the gujarat case study we will first understand the terminology then study the metric for the karnataka government and then compare it with other states in order to give you a holistic picture the first indicator is the most simple of all which is government debt to gsdp ratio or government debt to gross state domestic product So let's say the Gujarat government has 100 crores in debt and 500 crores in GDP. Then the debt to GSDP ratio of the Gujarat government is 100 divided by 500 into 100, which is 20%. Now is this good or bad? Well, if you look at this graph, this horizontal line represents the indicative targets of the 15th Finance Commission. In this case, this line lies between 33 to 35%. Now according to India's Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act 2005 the prescribed ceiling for the debt to GSDP ratio is 25%. So if this number is about 25% it's not good for the state. 
Now, if you look at Karnataka from 2017 to 2021, Karnataka's debt to GSDP ratio has gone up from 18.78% in 2017 to 19.87% in 2019 to 26.61% in 2021, and this has mainly increased due to the pandemic. Now, it is estimated that the debt to GSDP ratio for FY23 in Karnataka will be 24.2%. and this if you see is just slightly below the mandated number of 25% so what this says is that the government must keep a keen check on this metric then we come to the next metric and that are interest payments to revenue receipts this is again very very simple if you see just like we take home loans even the government takes loans for building bridges and doing other works so if the government collected 1000 crores from all streams of revenue but if it has to pay 400 crores to hdfc only in interest it means interest payments to revenue receipts is 400 divided by 1000 into 100 which is 40% so if 400 crores or 40% of the state's revenue is going only into interest payments it means that the government will have less money to invest in productive domains like infrastructure and development now according to rbi this number ideally should be less than 10% Now here while on one side as of 2021 22 while Bihar stood at 8.6% Chhattisgarh stood at 8% Odisha stood at 4.3% on the other side we had states that were paying very heavy interest payments and these were Kerala at 18.8% Tamil Nadu at 21% Punjab at 21.3% and West Bengal at 20.8% and during the same time Karnataka was at 14.3% and now it has climbed up to 15.15% Now again this is a cause of concern as the interest payments are well above the mandated limit of 10%. The third variable to consider is the fiscal deficit of the state. In simple words, when a state government's total expenditure exceeds its total revenues during a particular fiscal year, it's considered to have a fiscal deficit and this excludes the borrowings. For example, if the Maharashtra government's total revenue is 250 crores and its total expenditure is 340 crores, then its fiscal deficit is 340 crores minus 250 crores which is 90 crores. And this number is expressed as a percentage of the state GDP. Now, as per the guidelines, the states are allowed to have an FD of 3.5% of their GSDP and anything above 3.5% is not considered to be good. In this case, as of 2022, while Gujarat stood at 1.51%, Tamil Nadu stood at 3.8%, Karnataka stood at 2.84%. And in the latest state budget of FY24, the fiscal deficit in Karnataka is expected to be 2.6% of the GSDP. So here, Karnataka is doing pretty well. These are the most common indicators that state the financial state of Karnataka. Now although things look pretty much normal over here there is one big big concern. Turns out RBI has flagged Karnataka's revenue collection in one of the documents. The question is why? Well this is where Karnataka's GST problem came in. The GST has been utilized in a very bad sense and as well as uh... Uh, it has been sucking the blood of the common people. The Karnataka government has requested the Central Finance Ministry to extend the GST compensation by three years. But the state is only um, easing restrictions on businesses now. Rahul Gandhi today said that if the Congress comes to power in the Senate in 2024, he will not have GST, the goods and service tax, but just one tax. Now, to understand this problem, we first have to understand how GST works. So, if you know this already, please skip to this timestamp. But if you don't, here's a very very simple explanation of the same. Let's say a pack of juice costs hundred rupees to manufacture, and they have a profit margin of ten percent, which means the cost of production is hundred and ten rupees. Now, under the old tax system, the manufacturer would first add ten percent of his margin, which would make it hundred and ten rupees, and then twelve percent of excise duty gets added, making it one twenty three point two rupees, and twelve point five percent VAT gets added, making it one thirty eight point six rupees. This will be the invoiced amount to the wholesaler. Now when the wholesaler gets the juice she would add her 10% margin on this amount of 123.2 rupees plus 12.5% vat which will take the price of the juice to 152.46 rupees and she can claim an input tax credit on vat that is levied in her invoice Now you see the problem we hear is that the excise duty is levied and then 12.5% vat is applied on top of the summation which makes it tax on tax So here the vat went to the state government and excise duty went to the central government But after GST this is how the taxation system changed. Let's say the same pack of juice costs 100 rupees to manufacture and the manufacturer has a profit margin of 10% which means the cost of production is again 110 rupees. Now fruit juices are in the 12% GST category. So adding another 12% to this which is 13.2 rupees we have a total of 123.2 rupees. 
This is the amount that the manufacturer will invoice the next entity in the supply chain who is the wholesaler. So now that the wholesaler has bought the juice at 123.2 rupees, as per the new system, he will have to add 10% to 110 rupees and not the amount of 123.2 rupees. And since this invoice value of 123.2 rupees already includes a tax of 13.2 rupees, he is eligible for an input tax credit. So in the GST system, the value added by the wholesaler must be added to the basic sale price of the retailer, which is 110 rupees. So if he adds another 10% on the 110 rupees sales price, that makes the juice cost 110 plus 10%, which is 11 rupees to 121 rupees. And now the GST of 12% is to be added to this amount of 121 rupees. So we have 121 plus 12% 12 of 121, which is 14.52 rupees. Add that up and we have an amount of 135.52 rupees. This will be the cost of the same juice in the GST system. Now, whether this is good or bad, that's not the question. We've made a separate video on that and you can frame your opinion on the basis of that video. But what's more important to note is that for the states, initially it did not play out fairly. And this is because of the collection and distribution of taxes by the center. This is where the disparity between the producer state and the consumer state comes in. So as usual, let's try to understand this using an example. Let's say there is a packet of potato chips which are manufactured in Chennai and sold in Patna. Now here, Bihar would collect tax on the potato chips consumed in Bihar even if they were manufactured in Tamil Nadu. So if 12% IGST is collected in Bihar on potato chips, then 6 rupees goes to the consuming state and 6 rupees goes to the center. And from this share of the center, the central government might allocate a certain amount to the producer state. And this is very very problematic because states like Tamil Nadu have made massive investments on roads, highways and ports in order to create a conducive ecosystem for manufacturing to thrive. So until GST came in, they were entitled to extract a return on their investment by claiming taxes at the point of origin, as in the places where the goods were manufactured. And now this major income source was at stake. This is the reason why the Tamil Nadu state government had an objection with GST. So the incomes of the state dropped drastically after GST. And secondly, when GST was implemented, it caused a lot of chaos in the market, even for the businesses, because suddenly the entire taxation system was revolutionized in the country. And the states also lost out on revenue due to supply chain disruption. Now, it's not like the center did not understand this. The center knew very well that if GST is to be implemented, the system will have to bear the shock. This is the reason why the central government said that for the next five years, whatever is the revenue loss faced by the state government, for that, the central government will compensate. And here's what they did. They promised to create a projection for five years and tallied it with the actual GST revenues. For instance, if each year a state's tax revenue was expected to grow by 14%, and if the actual collection fell short of these projections, then the center promised to make up for this shortfall. So the center created a GST compensation fund to pay the states. And here's where the CES was implemented across India. But this promise actually came to an end on June 2022. And while some states managed to recover their revenues, Karnataka hasn't done a great job. As you can see from this table, post GST, Karnataka has one of the lowest revenue growth rates among the major states. And it fell from 12.6% to 3.3% from pre to post GST. And now, while Maharashtra is at 9.5%, Gujarat is at 7.2%, UP is at 11.3%, Tilangana is at 12.2%, Tamil Nadu is at 6%. This is the financial aspect of the government of Karnataka. If this is very, very clear to you, let's understand the second dimension and that are social indicators. Now people, in social indicators, we have three indicators, education, healthcare and social welfare. These are amenities that the government is supposed to provide to them. Bicycles, not available. Shoes, socks, not available. Sanitary pads, something that is repeatedly given to encourage female students to come to school. Even that is not made available. So even basic things for education not being provided to students in Karnataka schools. Many senior leaders have tweeted and uh, accuse the government and the health minister of negligence. The state of Karnataka is likely to witness an indefinite massive strike today by the government employees. The first metric that we're going to talk about is education. For this, we need to study something called the gross enrollment ratio. So as usual, let's try to understand this using an example. Let's consider a hypothetical situation for Sikkim's higher education sector. Let's assume that in 2023, the official higher education age population, as in the population which is between 18 to 23 years old is 1 million. And the total number of students enrolled in higher education institutions, regardless of their age, is 600,000. 
So the gross enrollment ratio is total enrolled students divided by the total population in the official higher education population into 100. In this case, the GER is 600,000 divided by 1 million into 100, which is 60%. Now the national education policy is targeted to increase the GER to 50% as of 2020. Whereas even now, Karnataka stood way below at just 32%. And in the same year, Tamil Nadu stood at 51.4%, Delhi was at 48%, Gujarat was even terrible at 21.3%. Apart from that, as of 2022, Karnataka had 1.41 lakh vacant teacher posts in government schools and colleges. And as it turns out, barely 60% of its 15 to 16 year olds actually enter the 11th grade. And you know what? The irony is that we are soon releasing a case study on the rise of Bengaluru. And surprisingly, Bengaluru became a legendary city because of education. And now from the numbers, it looks like the government of Karnataka is not paying enough attention to education. This is because even though NEP 2020 recommends a state to spend 6% of its GDP on education, Karnataka barely spent 2.07% on education. And this brings us to the second metric, and that is health. Now, even though a state government is expected to spend 3% of its GDP into healthcare, Karnataka government spends only 0.7% of its GSDP on health. And if you look at the impact of the spending cut, it is disastrous. In spite of high per capita income, the infant mortality rate in Karnataka is three times more than that of Kerala. And 46% more children die within a year in Karnataka than in Tamil Nadu. And as per the National Family Health Survey 5, Karnataka has 97% institutional deliveries with registered births, with two-thirds of these births in public facilities. This implies that the women, babies, and infants and toddlers are dying either due to the lack of quality healthcare or the negligence by the public institutions. These are just some of the many, many repercussions of Karnataka government not spending on healthcare. And lastly, we come to the social welfare indicator. Now here, according to RBI's latest report on total social sector expenditure, Karnataka again is way behind the national average. While the average of the total expenditure on the social sector for all states and union territories is at 42.4%, for Karnataka, it is 38.8%. So long story short, Karnataka is a rich state that is doing a terrible job with healthcare and education, but is doing a great job by being a good capitalistic state for businesses. And the party that wins must focus on these aspects for the next five years so that the people at the bottom of the pyramid can be uplifted and can be given better facilities. And this brings us to the last part of the episode and that is the analysis of the ease of business in Karnataka. Karnataka is soon becoming an ideal choice for investment in India. The government of Karnataka is ensuring their policies and infrastructure promote industrial development. Welcome to Nava Karnataka, a state of continuous progress where we focus now on the manufacturing and engineering space. It has been through a mix of public-private partnerships and competitive policies which have invited some of the biggest names, both Indian and foreign, right here into the state. You see guys, for any state to prosper and flourish, it constantly needs to attract businesses in the state. And when more and more companies actually come in, they give jobs, they pay taxes and eventually they boost the economy of the state. And for these companies to come, the state government needs to work very hard to build a conducive business ecosystem and infrastructure. And as far as Karnataka government is concerned, the first thing that comes to our mind is Bengaluru, which is the IT powerhouse of India. And because we have done a detailed case study on Bengaluru specifically, we know for sure that Karnataka has done a phenomenal job with ease of business in Bengaluru. But in the past three years, they have done something even more extraordinary. In 2017, the central government's Department for Promotion of Trade and Industry released a ranking called the Ease of Doing Business Ranking. And this gets published every year. Here, you will be shocked to know that Karnataka was ranked 8th in 2017 and then slipped to 19th position in 2019. But the DPIIT suggested 187 reforms to be executed. And I was just stunned to know that the government of Karnataka literally implemented 100% of these reforms. And now Karnataka ranks as the number one state in ease of doing business in the same goddamn table. And to achieve this, 30 plus state departments coordinated to implement various reforms across areas, ranging from the most bureaucratic practices like affidavit clearance, land reforms, central inspection system, single window clearance to even sectorial policies. And the result? Well, during the first two quarters of 2021-22, Karnataka accounted for 48% and 41% of the total foreign direct investment in India respectively. This is how swift the government of Karnataka is with ease of doing business. And this brings us to the conclusion of the case study. So now, based on the numbers, the agenda of the parties, based on the promises and the performance of the parties, you can then choose the candidate of your choice. 
Meanwhile, I am also attaching a ton of study materials to help you understand other nuances which we could not cover in this case study. So do read through them and let me know what you think. That's all from my side for today, guys. If you learned something valuable, please make sure to the like button in order to make YouTube Baba happy. And for more such insightful business and political case studies, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next one. Bye bye.